working full time. So I had maybe an hour or two per day I was using to study. In this video, I am going to introduce to you Justin Mutawasit. He is the former baggage handler ramp agent for an airline that in less, less, yes, less than one year became a certified pilot. How are you doing, Justin? I'm doing awesome. Thanks so much for having me today. Thank you for coming. It is an esteemed honor to have you on board because you have accomplished what many have seen as insurmountable, even someone like me, because I have seen people who have encountered similar challenges. And as I was telling you previously, it has been very tough for them to accomplish goals that you have set for yourself and met and you've done it. You've become a pilot in under a year's time and now you're working for Delta Airlines. How is that experience so far? been fantastic. It's been a fantastic journey. Uh, it's been uh, rewarding, I'd say, over a lot of work, but really rewarding. Since the age of five, you were exposed to some cockpit controls on a Delta Airlines flight, and you were just hooked. You were like, I will be a pilot or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I was five. Growing up in New York City, my, my mother flew me, uh, my sister down from New York to uh, Orlando for uh, just a fifth you know, birthday kind of present to, to Disney World. And I got to take a tour of the flight deck and I was just absolutely taken back by it. I was like, I want to do that the rest of my life. From the get-go, from that point on, I knew that was what I wanted to do. Um, and just fell obsessed with airplanes, didn't ever think I could actually do it. I just said, that's what I want to do someday. That's my dream goal. Went to middle school and to high school. And I had some teachers kind of tell me, well, you got glasses, you can't really fly airplanes for a living. So throw that out of the window. So that's what I did, threw it out of the window. I pursued other things. I got into broadcast tech uh, and, and worked up pretty well into that, became a director doing some uh, different sports shows in Dallas where I live now, and then ended up uh, going to school for that. I wasn't happy with what I was doing in life at that point in time. I didn't see myself, you know, continuing that trajectory uh, career-wise. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to take a break, take a semester off, figure out my life, we'll re-strategize. I don't want to waste time and money doing something I'm happy doing. So uh, in that time, I said, I'm not going to just be sitting at home doing nothing. I want a, a job. What do, you know, what do I want to do? I've worked in retail, I've worked in, in food service. None of that interests me. Oh, airplanes. I've always wanted to work with airplanes. All right. Uh, so I got a job at the airport loading bags. And it was supposed to be six months, turned into a year and a half because I was having so much fun and I enjoyed just all the aspects of the airline life, the behind the scenes and all the logistics. And so I said, I want to work in aviation. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have a degree. I don't have the vision to fly airplanes. So I'm just going to do something. I looked at going to the Air Force, looked at going to some, some community colleges for air traffic control. And then I met a couple of pilots and, and I, I said, well, is this something I can actually do? And I did the research. And I realized, yeah, I actually can do it. I've got the vision I need to be able to fly airplanes. Uh, so I was able to talk to a couple of pilots, started to network was the biggest thing, just learn, get information about the the career itself, what it takes to get to, to where I am now. I uh, went to flight school. This takes you now to about 2016 or so when I started flight school. Um, and I went to a, kind of an accelerated course. So it was zero to all of my basic licenses in a year, which is about eight licenses you get in total there. And you finish off pretty much as a flight instructor. The goal you have to do now is you have to build yourself from uh, from about 200 hours of flying time up to 1,500 hours. That's what you need to get hired to your first basic airline. Um, so I spent another year after that as a flight instructor building up all my experience to get hired at my first airline, kind of a, a starter intro airline, uh, and then work my way up from there over a few years eventually to get to Delta. According to NBC, I believe in middle school, a teacher said that you wouldn't be able to do it because... You had corrective lenses. Did you undertake any type of apprenticeship program or, or were you just studying everything you could on becoming a pilot between that time during those years? Yeah, sure. So it was a lot of just self-study, a lot of, um, you know, just watching YouTube videos. And I used to play flight simulator all the time. I had a flight simulator. My mom got me a little $50 uh, joystick so I could kind of fly around with that. Uh, and that's where I really started to form the, the you can almost call it an addiction to, to flying itself. Awesome. So I didn't know anyone. I didn't know the resources, how to get into it. Didn't really have the mm -hmm. internet back then to to really look and delve into organizations. But nowadays, we have organizations out there that can really help people kind of find what they want to do within aviation. Okay, great. So, what happens after this middle school teacher erroneously tells you that you couldn't become an airline pilot? Did you just throw it out the window? Like, oh, I'll never become an airline. Is that what happened? Yeah, I threw it out the window. I didn't think I was ever capable of doing it. Uh, not only just a vision thing, but just a confidence thing in general. I didn't think I had the smarts to do it. And so I said, all right, I'm putting that away. What else do I want to do? I want to work with cameras. So I got into the broadcast television and, and spent about six years in total work in broadcast. 
Oh, six years uh, in, in broadcast journalism. So, and did, did you get a uh, degree? According to the, your profile, did, did you uh, get the associate's degree between, was a couple of months, was it? Or, or how? No, yeah. yeah, no, I didn't. So I, that, uh, that I took one semester and then after that semester, I said, you know what, this is not going the way I want it to go. So let me take a break and figure out my life. So long story short, a few years later, I got back into school now. So I've been slowly checking away my degree, but still don't have a degree currently. I saw like a four month degree in, in, four, in from no, that would have that just been the time I was in school. Oh, just the time you, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. I was like, wow, like, this guy's a genius. He got an associate degree in four <laughs> months. I was like, I, I need to know more about that. All right. Now, do, do you feel that your education towards your associate's degree initially, did that help you in any way towards obtaining certification to become a pilot in less than a year's time? It did. Yeah, the math, the science definitely helped a lot because it's a lot of physics, it's a lot of, of just basic uh, okay. of basic math you're dealing with. So that was definitely what I needed uh, kind of beforehand to get me into the groove because it's not impossible, it's math and science, but there is math and science involved no matter what. Right. That's what that's one of the things that I always thought of, like, you have to know physics because I guess you have to know, all right, uh, we're flying towards a certain angle on a mountain or whatever. And we you have to know, I guess, the amount of time it's going to take for you to have to swerve the plane out of the way, I guess, or something like that. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, you know, we got geometry, you got just basic physics, mm -hmm. physics evolved, thermodynamics. There's a lot of little things there's throughout science itself that starts to play into a role of a normal flight. So you have to have those prerequisites already established as a foundation before you enter flight school, or is that to become a, an airline pilot? Not, no, not required, actually. A lot of it you learn while you're in flight school, but having oh. that link up is, is is super helpful to understand. Okay, I got you. It gives, yeah. Right, right. It gives you a solid foundation. All right. Yeah, because, I mean, I you, you always get like these opinions from people who have made X amount of money, you know, millions of dollars that they say that, you know, college is a waste of time. For me... I actually have one year left to complete my bachelor's degree, but I see how, although college constitutes, I believe, the basics of what you require to execute certain pro professions, those basics are like essential because it teaches you how to learn. Basically, that, that, that's what I, that's what yeah. that's my opinion on it. That you because I mean I, I came from Jamaica Queens, New York. That's what they it's known for, like shooting a cop back in the days because th th there was a big uh cop shooting and all these drug programs anti-drug programs the war on drugs mm. got kicked off because of a lot of what happened in jamaica queens that's how bad it was the crack wars and stuff so going to school it actually gave me put my foot on a position where i'm able to fend for myself you know in corporate environments i'm able to learn other ways of generating revenue and practicing other professions so i i'm glad i guess that that uh that you definitely see it that way and i, I think that's the way it is so yeah i think education is important you know even though i i took that break i promised myself i'd get back to school uh you know it's not required in the aviation field for flying these days but it's something i personally wanted to do i like to continue to learn and grow so no that's perfect and as i get older i mean you're always learning i think the day that you stop learning you might as well not be here anymore it's just like and i see people unfortunately that when they stop learning people close to me that they just, they don't get anywhere. They don't keep progressing either physically or mentally, spiritually, right. professionally. It's crazy. So I noticed that ATP, the school that you attended, they offered a uh, an airline ATP tuition reimbursement program. Did the airline with which you initially work or any of the airlines participate in that program to help you pay for the school? Yeah, they did. I didn't take partake in that. Uh, that gets into a whole different conversation on stuff but uh, i didn't partake in that i decided that i wanted to keep my options open the 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 gist of it is you sign on to one of those programs kind of early on you know in right. your your time building experience while you're working up to that 1500 hours and you're telling the airline i'll go fly for you guys and they'll give you a little money back kind of as a, as a retention bonus uh my idea was i want to keep my options open wait till i'm just close to getting those hours to see how the market's behaving Right. And then I'll execute you know, on one of those companies. So I held off. I didn't sign up for anything. I know as the ones that did, you know, obviously did that because it helps you out financially uh, in the interim to, to pay off your loans. But I held off and just uh, and stayed independent. A lot of these airlines, the your base, you know, in, uh, intro airlines, so to speak, they offer bonuses as soon as you sign on. You know, sometimes it's twenty thousand dollars or whatever uh, over a certain period of years. This program just kind of gets that money to you a little earlier to pay off your loan. So I held off on that and just paid off the loans on my own. Okay. No, I'm just uh, I'm just curious because a number of people that watch us they 
I guess they would like to know how accessible it is for someone who has limited resources. So I'm not sure if I read it or I listened to it on NBC. Did, did your mother, she sign off on the loan? She co-signed. Yeah, she co-signed. That was super, 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 super important uh, was getting someone to co-sign the loan. I mean, at that time I was 19 years old. So who's going to okay. give you know $90,000 to a 19 year old? So. Right. And well, I should say there are, there are other options out there uh, in between. Uh, there's a lot of scholarships these days. There's several okay. organizations in aviation that provide scholarships to all sorts of people and all sorts of backgrounds. So if you ever feel like you can't do it, do the research because it turns out there's a lot of money out there that they want to give you. How much is the tuition? It depends on the school and, you know, what, where there's a bunch of schools out there these days. I would say on average, eighty to ninety thousand dollars is pretty fair. Uh, sometimes lower, sometimes higher. If you're going to get a degree coupled with it, it'll be higher. If you're right. going to a small school in the you know middle of uh, Ohio, you might pay fifty thousand or sixty thousand. Okay, and what are the entrance requirements? Generally, like, uh, you academically, to, you need to be able to work in the United States, so passport okay. or green card, uh, a high school diploma, okay, or a uh, GED. Uh, let's see here. The ability to correct your vision of 2020 is very important. So we get into, when it talks about aviation, we have to have what's called a first class medical. This first class medical you get once a year, depending on your age, sometimes six times, or sorry, uh, every six months. So on this medical, you're doing things like your vision, uh, heart, you know, heart, um, basic stuff, uh, hearing and whatnot, but you got to be able to hold one of those first class medicals every year. So you want to make sure you can actually get one of those before you even get into flight school, because there's no point in going halfway through your hours and realizing I can't get hired in an airline because I don't have the, the medical license to do so. So that's the biggest thing is, is can you work in the United States? And then can you hold that first class medical? They're not difficult, but you need to be able to obtain one. There's certain things like background history uh, for surgeries, mental things like that. You have to make sure you check boxes off on. And for the loan itself, do you have to have like a good credit and stuff or is it just uh, is it based off some some something else? Is it kind of like a student loan? You know, it's uh, it's it's not it's not federal. And so that's the issue you get into. A lot of it gets based off credit score history of of the credit itself. I mean, I didn't have I, I probably didn't have even have a credit score at that point in time. So definitely my mother having the the higher, better credit score you know, definitely drove the approval. I've seen people with relatively low credit scores get approved with no co-signer and uh, as long as they had a source of income. So it just depends. I don't, I can't give you a definite answer on what the company, right. what the, uh, cause you know, Sally Mae that does all that. So it depends on what they're looking for. Oh, so Sally Mae does get involved with it. I think Sally Mae. Through May ATP. Is yeah. 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 Okay. I got you. And what's the initial payment? Is the, do they just, Want you to finance the whole 80 grand or you have to have like, I don't know, five grand to start off or how does it work? You know, from what I can recall, it's been a few years now. I think I put it was a thousand I had to put down. That was for ATP specific stuff it was a thousand right. down. And then Sally May would forward a quarterly check to ATP for that quarter. Mm -hmm. Good to go for the quarter. Uh, you just had to start paying back. I think it was six months after uh, I had a program. I was grandfathered in. And I think six months after I finished my last license, I was able to uh, defer for six months and then pay my, my monthly, uh, payment. Okay. Now, so let's just roll back a little bit to when you decided to get a job as a ramp agent, was yeah. that part of the plan or is just like, I'm just going to go work at the airport. It was, it was more of a curiosity. I didn't know I could get into okay. flying at that point in time. It's more of a, I want to work around airplanes. I want to okay. that. that makes me happy. So let me go. This is what I've always wanted to do. Let me go try that out. Okay. Now you went from becoming, a a ramp agent to a supervisor to an instructor. That was also in less than a year? That was, yeah, in about, in about a year, a uh, year and a half. And what did you do to get promoted that quickly? You know, it was nothing just short of me showing interest. I okay. was really into the job and my bosses saw that and they identified that I had that that potential skill. So I'm super appreciative of them to say, hey, look, this this kid's this kid likes what he's doing. He's good at what he's doing right now. Let's promote him up. So it was just me showing up to work. It was me enjoying what I was doing, asking questions, um, helping out where I could within the organization. And they said, hey, do you want to be a supervisor? Hey, how about, hey, our instructor's leaving. Do you want to be an instructor as well? And I said, I mean, I'm, I'm at this point 19. I don't know how to teach people, but I'm up for the challenge. And right, so right. I realized there I love to teach. And that took me into eventually into flight instructing. And I still teach to this day inside of aviation. So.
were you educating yourself to to advance in your career while you I were was. a ramp agent? Ramp yeah. agent? So I had I had several mentors uh, that were able to give me different uh, software online that I could study. So I, I, during in between flights, you know, I had 30, 40 minutes off between the flight. I was studying for my written exam for my private license and then my commercial license before I even started flight school itself. All right. So now now you're on the path towards becoming a pilot when right. while you're performing these studies of which you just spoke. So you had already met Mr. Ivor Martin? Yeah, Ivor Martin. Yes, 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 yes. Ivor, so, okay, I'm sorry. I, oh, no worries. No worries at all. So, yeah, I'd met him right in that time period, uh, about a year in to this endeavor at working at the ramp so far is where I met him. I met another pilot as well that uh, they both helped me figure out that, hey, yeah, it is possible for you. And here's the steps you need to take to get to, to where you want to be. You spoke to him on an employee bus, if uh, according to NBC. Did you plan on on speaking to him to learn more about what he was doing, like, or would you just want to be his friend? No, it was one of those things where I saw this guy, and you know, me being of, of African descent and him being black as well, I said, you know, I don't see a lot of black pilots that often. That's someone that I should probably talk to and figure out what his life story is and how he got to where he is today. Um, so it, it was mostly curiosity. It was mostly just a little bit of courage to, to just kind of, hey, how are you doing today? And we started building some rapport that way, and we see each other more and more in passing over the next few months and that's what started our relationship. How did the whole conversation of him mapping out that career path for you get into play? Yeah, so it actually started off with another fellow. His name is Christian. Um, he was kind of the base of, of everything here. I really, you know, I still talk to him to this day because I'm really appreciative of him for everything he's done. But uh, I would see him in passing in the airport all the time and I'd say, who's this guy? Like everyone gives, you know, saying hi to this guy. He's got a really good relationship. Everyone at the airport. I want to be this guy. Right. And so I, I started talking to him a little bit here and there and I realized, hey, you know, I'm looking now, you know, about a year into this, I'm looking at this split between do I want to go air traffic control or do I want to go into flying? And I said, mm. hey, can you give me the pros and cons to each? And he just sat down with me and he spent 30 minutes of his own time just talking to me. And I felt uh, I felt very touched by that, you know, almost like uh, like this 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 big high person this captain in airlines talking to me. You know, um, and so that was like a, a really groundbreaking moment. And so I it took some time and I realized I want to get in the fly. I want to try at least if I fail. So be it. Let me try. Um, and so he said, OK, let me put you in touch with this guy named Ivor. Now, I'd never met Ivor at the point in time. Fast forward now, about a week later, I get in the bus. I'm talking to this guy and I start putting the pieces together. And it was like, wait a second. I think this is the I'm pretty like we're talking. I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is the guy that Christian just told me about. Oh, so OK. I said, is your name Ivor? He goes, yeah, it is. And so oh, we just like, immediately hit it off. So it was, just, it was just kind of luck that we happened to be on the bus together. I hadn't talked to the guy yet. I had his information, but I hadn't reached out to him. So it was just this perfect uh, kind of coincidence. So you had spoken to Christian about potentially becoming a pilot or what type of options you could exercise to become a pilot prior to speaking right. to Ivor. Right. And then okay, once, so I said, okay, I wanna, once I said I want to get into flying, he said, okay, talk to this guy named Ivor. He's a lot more in touch with the current training and all this stuff these days that it's involved. And so Ivor was the one who helped me figure out, okay, um, you know, here's the flight school I want you to go to. Here's the, you know, we, we're going to get you to do your written exams early before you start flight school. That way you can walk in with all the knowledge you need. Wow. Um, and he was the one that really laid out that, that foundation. Christian got me the information I needed. And then Ivor helped me set up that game plan. Okay, so also you all right. So how long did you spend completing your written exams prior to entering flight school? I spent about six months, and that was you know working full time. So I had maybe an hour or two per day I was using to study. An hour or two per day. That's good. That that's good. I mean, that's very doable. You don't. Yeah, you're not, it definitely you're is. It's definitely doable. You're you're getting regular sleep at that time, and yep, you're, yep. You're, and I'm just doing it between you know during breaks at work. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit after work as well. Okay. All right. Now, before I forget, I, you told me that you were also of part Dominican descent. I I know that there's a big obstacle. My family's Colombian, and I actually have a couple of Dominican cousins. And a lot of the obstacles that people that migrate from other countries, some of whom also watch my channel, their challenge is limited speaking, English speaking ability. So did you see anybody that potentially encountered those types of problems or obstacles while you were attending a flight school and were they able to to get through that or? Yeah, yeah. So I had people of several different backgrounds, uh, not just, you know, Hispanic, but also Asian as well. And just all sorts of international students that dealt with that problem. Um, you know, a lot of it is find people around you that you can relate to that can help you 
you know, figure out the little things, especially the nuances of, of the aviation language itself. We've got organizations these days. So, I mean, so we've got the Latino Pilots Association, LPA, that's a fantastic resource that can help you figure out, hey, um, you know, here's a place or here's a resource online to help you figure out, you know, how this equates to that, right? So, um, yeah, there's many organizations out there. There's, there's uh, we've got Latino Pilots Association, the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, um, uh, Women in Aviation, We've got um, the Asian Pilots Association. So there's so many things that so many boosters out there these days to help you out. Okay. Yeah. If you could send me some links to the, to, to some yeah, of those sure. organizations later on, that'd be great. Wow. That's awesome. No, that, that that's awesome indeed. I mean, so what kind of obstacles on your way to getting pilot certifications did you think were insurmountable? Like, were there anything where you just said, man, all right, so I'm already started, but I'm going to get through this. And then what did you do to get through it? Yeah. So a lot of it's confidence. It's you look at this big timeline. It's like you want right. to get to an airline. You want to become, you know, get to the big, the big tier. You know, we call them the, the the big three, one of those big three airlines. And you look at all these different licenses and these these ratings you have to get just to get to your first airline. And right. you get stressed out because you're like, how am I going to do this? It, it, like, this is so much. You, you, you get a pile of books on your first day. Right. And they say, all right, here you go. You figure this out for the next few months. And you're like, where do I start? Right. So the biggest thing I tell people now is, is it's bite by bite. You're not eating the whole meal in one go, right? It's bite by bite. Let's look at the first lesson. Let's look at today's lesson of the day. Let's focus on that, right? So wow. you know, no matter what airline I go to, what you know, airplane I'm learning, I'm taking it day by day because if you look at the big picture, you stress yourself out. You know, I'm going back to I go back to to, to I'm going back to flight school. Uh, at the end of this month, I'm actually upgrading to captain, so I have to go redo my entire program again from from kind of first day at Delta, you know, so to speak, for another month. And so it's like, don't stress out about that. Focus on day one. Do I know what I need to know for day one? If not. Let me look at, you know, what, what they need me to, to cover for the day so I can walk in prepared. And that's what I took with me all my career was uh, was just focusing bite by bite. OK, that's yeah. I mean, my sentiments exactly. <laughs> but everything, because once you see that big path that you have to walk and potentially at a snail's pace or whatever pace at which you can manage it, your brain can't process that. It's just it's just like, wow, it's too. It's too great, but if you take everything step by step, day by day, the path of a hundred steps starts with the first steps, and you just got to focus on ensuring that you execute that rep as perfectly as possible. You know, like when I'm when you're working out or whatever the case may be, and just doing it. Now, what was your routine while you were undergoing the studies of getting certified? Like, uh, like what time did you wake up? Like, how and did you get enough sleep? All this other stuff. Like, what can you tell me about that? Yeah. So the nicest thing was the fact that Ivor had me do all of those licenses beforehand. It made my time in flight school a lot easier because I had the foundation the knowledge now. Now it was just applying it to actually flying the airplane uh, every day. So most days wake up around 8 a.m., maybe 7 a.m. We go drive to flight school, which for me was about 10 minutes down the road from my my, my parents' house. Uh, you know, you do you'd, you'd brief kind of the night before by yourself. You'd have access to the lesson for the next day. You'd look through all the content, what you're going to cover for the day. You know, so when you're doing your first license, a lot of primary stuff of how to take off, how to land, how to operate around the airport, how to talk to air traffic control, certain maneuvers you're learning, things like that. So um, usually you go for one flight a day, about two hours or so was average, sometimes more, but usually at least two hours from, you know, maybe eight to 10 or nine to 11. And then after that, a little break for lunch. And then we'll be studying afterwards as well. Again, the nice part was the fact that I had that kind of leg up for my classmates is that I already knew all the knowledge I needed. It was more of a refresher for me than it was trying to cram the knowledge in at one point, you know, at, at the same time. So we were able to do these group lessons together kind of, and hey, any questions here? Hey, let's work. Here's what I, my interpretation of it. Let's find the answer in the book. That preparation to actually taking on the studies that you would perform at the flight school is very key in ensuring that you were able to get through the certifications as expeditiously as possible, if I'm not mistaken. That's yeah, and, and, and to relieve the stress, absolutely, yeah. Wow, that's awesome. That's that's awesome, man. So, all right, so you got up at eight and then you start flying in, in the morning for two hours? And yeah, usually you... about two hours a day. And then you're studying afterwards, you know, kind of your discretion on how much you want to study depends on, again, if you've prepared or not from beforehand. But I'd probably say you're going from eight to about 3 p.m. Uh, it's pretty fair each day. Sometimes you fly in the evening because there's certain flights you have to knock out in the evening for nighttime certification stuff. 
sometimes you're having to go fly early in the morning because it's summertime out in Texas and you know you don't want to be flying at 10 a.m. You want to fly at six in the morning where it's still cold out. So things like that. Are you still holding the position at? I, I, I'm not even sure what what a, what an airline you worked as a as a ramp agent. Yeah, so actually, I was ironically at Delta as well, which is kind of a cool. Oh, wow, nice. thing. Uh, but no, I had actually I left the, that full time position just to focus purely on school. I wanted to focus, be as good as I could in wow. flight school. So I was still working in broadcast. I had two jobs: I was working the airline and working broadcast. So I dropped the airline job, but I was still working part time uh, as a broadcast director, kind of in the evenings as well. Okay, and that was every day. That was probably three or four times a week. Three or four times a week, and then the the, the other days, what you just be the whole day at at the, at the flight school. Yeah, that's about right. Most of my broadcast gigs normally were in the evening, so it was, you know, 5, 6 p.m. So I was able to kind of be done by 3, go change, and then work from 6 to 9 or 10. And the, the flight school, every day, it's from, it's from what, the, practically 8 to 3, and then you, you're also – you sometimes go in for some extra hours until... Yeah, sometimes on the weekends, sometimes, you know, when you go to a program like ATP, it's designed to be very fast. So if the weather's good, we're going to fly. That's kind of the logic there. So a lot of your time was spent, I mean, sometimes five days a week, sometimes it was seven days a week, if we could get the mm -hmm. flying. Really, if the student was correlating everything and it was everything was making sense, let's keep going, right? Why, okay. why slow you down? What type of sacrifices did you become to ultimately become an airline pilot, like while you were studying and... After you obtain your certifications, like what were there any time wasters? Um, I don't know, video streaming or partying friends. You know, um, definitely there's definitely external influences. I'll call them that. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of it was I I lived at home. I okay. just, just 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 to save money because it's it's expensive. You know, every month I was paying yeah. seven hundred bucks a month and and just loan uh, repayment, not including your normal life bills. Right, so I stayed at home for as long as I could for about. Uh, for the first two years of that time, you know, experience before I got hired at my first airline. Then even when I moved on my own, I had a roommate. I was very, very, very digital about what money I was spending. I was saving where I could and still, you know, obviously paying off my loan regularly as well. So uh, financially, I think the biggest sacrifice you have to take is just being uh, fiscally responsible with the money you're going to be getting. Because a lot of people will just go and buy a fancy car. And this is what happened. I'll just, just tell you, this is what happened right during COVID. You know, I got hired uh, about six months prior to COVID, my first airline, things were going great until they weren't. And all of a sudden the money dried up and there wasn't flying anymore. And all of a sudden they said, hey, we're going to have to furlough you guys. And a lot of people took the bonus that they got and they spent it on a car. I took mine and put it in savings. Wow, nice. So now I had some cushion. So it's just being smart with your money, I think, is the is the biggest kind of transition as you start to make all this money, it's, you know, being responsible with it. Make sure you pay off your loans and take care of your life and set yourself up for success for your retirement. All right. So while you were doing this, it's nothing to the extreme where you had to go through like sleepless nights or anything like that, taking as many of your wake time hours and just putting it towards towards your, your studies. Yeah. You know, it was just definitely thr it was throttling down on the social aspect of life, you know, not going out with the friends all the time and folks, hey, I got to study on a Friday night sometimes. I got a flight on Saturday. I got to go do a three, four hour flight on Saturday with my instructor. Uh, and then as I became a flight instructor itself, I'm flying eight hours a day with my students. I don't have time to go out to a party that evening because I got to be up at five the next morning to go fly with my student. So it's just understanding how to balance your time, balancing your studies. And, you know, sometimes that means you can't go out to the party or the lake that weekend. It's, hey, I got to go fly because this is going to progress my career. You did tell me about seeking mentorship. So, of course, you also talked about Christian and you sp spoke to Ivor, but what about when you were going through the school itself? Did you obtain any extra tutoring when you were stuck on something or did you, was there any benefit working with groups? Or yeah. So I'm a big advocate for working in groups. I mean, to this day, uh, at my airlines, I'm always about working together in groups because you don't know what you don't know. So until you start asking questions, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so at my first airline, I remember this, we were all, you know, fresh, brand new. Most of us were 22, 23 at our first airline. We didn't know much about how to fly a jet. We had a million and one questions. There was people who kind of lingered by themselves and they just did their own thing and started. Then it was us who would show up, you know, we'd do our own self-study and we'd come in together as a group around, you know, 8 p.m. and just sit for an hour or two and just make sure we understood tomorrow's lesson or we understood whatever today we'll cover today. Uh, and it was the, the group of us that kind of helped pull each other to the finish line that did well versus that lone person that kind of just did their own thing. They struggled because they didn't ask questions. They didn't know other, you know, they didn't bring in different, you know, kind of um, realms of experience that everyone brought little bits of information to the table from their pre prior experience. Okay. Now, based off everything that you've told me, 
it feels like once you had this conversation with Christian and then subsequently with with Mr. Martin, kind of like a a structural mindset, just like it was a reawakening. It, it, it was, was it, it was, was that like an aha moment and then it just like organized you completely like all right this is what i'm gonna do this you know i'm gonna get this done this done this done yeah uh, it was it was very much a first it was a can i do this and then once i realized i can do it it was a how fast can i do this okay and what do i need to get this done quick and that's that's where i ever was like all right we're doing this this and this and i said you got it boss let's go uh and i just devoted as much time and energy as i could into that got it done in a year you know, got hired at my first airline. I spent about just under three years in my first airline, went to another airline for about six months, and then I got hired at Delta. So from my first lesson to starting at Delta was five and a half years, which is very fast to do historically. It used to take 10 years for most people. So that mentorship was real key, do you believe, to obtain de- these certifications? Definitely. To, to continue to encourage me, to give me the foundation. Um, and so now Ivor uses me as his little, he called me his, his little like, guinea pig. But, uh, you know, because I was this first person he helped figure out from kind of zero all the way to an airline and now to a you know, captain position at a big airline. Uh, so now he's got other people that come to him. And so now he's starting the same process again from zero for another, you know, five, six years. The one thing that I keep in my mindset or like the key objective whenever I meet, sometimes I meet people without any ulterior motive. They help me in my career. But the key thing that I'm always thinking about is how can I help the person? I've written for Forbes magazine. I've written for several iconic mainstream publications and I've been able to do it by always providing, because these people, they get you know thousands of pitches. And for me to stand out, like for instance, to get on Forbes, I drove like millions of unique visitors to their platform to get the attention of their editor. And he came back to me. You got to meet, you had the blessing of meeting Christian, Ivor. You all worked in the same space. So it was along the lines of you getting involved with the space and 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 investing your time to actually get in the right circles that could actually mentor you to putting you on the correct path. So, I mean, how would you think that would translate? Like, how would you advise someone who's just trying to do whatever it is that they want to do, whether they want to be a pilot, whether they want to be an entrepreneur, whether they want to be a doctor, like how do you advise them based off of your experience at a high level, at you know, or as the at, as at a, a granular level as you can get, for them to actually get in the right circles where they can find that structure where they can say, okay, this is my solid path that will get me towards becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a, or a technologist or an entrepreneur. Absolutely, or a pilot. The first thing is is figuring out the organizational structure of whatever you're trying to get into. Okay. So if I know I want to get into, you know, well, I don't want to say business. I don't know business that well, but I want to get into business, right? I want to get into into marketing, for example, or into, into real estate. It's, hey, who's the big player in the game right now? Let me go figure out if I can go talk to them. I can't talk to them. Let me move down a step, right? And work right. away if, even if, if it's from the bottom, right? So for me, it was, I'll tell you what, it, you know, at the airline, it was a supervisor just a little bit above me who I started just becoming friends with. And he said, hey, you like airplanes a lot. Do you want access to this little um, uh, learning tool that the pilots get? And I said, "Eh, sure, I've never, I don't know what any of this is, but sure. So he gave me access to this little learning thing. And I'm, you know, I haven't even touched an airplane yet. And so those little things like that, you start to build a network up. And over time, you get you build names. You say, "Hey, I know so and so. Hey, I know so and so as well." Mm. So, th- and again, this comes full circle where I was at a uh, a job fair for another airline back during COVID, and I I name dropped Ivor, and the guy from again a totally different airline goes, "Yeah, I know Ivor Martin." He said, "You know what? If you know Ivor, I know Ivor. Let me get you an interview." So you'd be surprised the people that you know in this industry, in any industry, that know each other. So it's important to, to not build, uh, burn bridges, but to figure out the structure of the organization and work your way up as, as high as you can to continue to build uh, connections. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. I thank you. Wow. That That is absolutely yeah, That's beautiful. Yeah. Because like I said, you, you, you look for the top and then you just keep working yourself down as you actually make access. And I noticed that with you, based off everything you've told me, you just take advantage of every resource on which you can put your hands, if I'm not mistaken, right? You right. just are able to- You gotta, you gotta get yourself in the door, that's it. You gotta figure out where the door is and get into it. Right, yeah, I mean, every single tool, every digital feature that you can find, every person that, that can that can lead you towards using it, and every way to get you beyond the next step. Wow, is there anything else you'd like to add for our people, man? Yeah, I'd say, you know, surround yourself with like-minded people, people that you are interested in the same thing you're interested in with. Build that circle early on. I've got friends that from day one of flight school that I still talk to, you know, now that we've made it to our our dream carriers, right? Um, yeah, stay committed, 
Don't let outside things distract you. That's the hardest part about, I think, getting into flying is there's a lot of content you're trying to absorb, but you still have life to deal with as well. So find that balance between school, between life. And this applies to really anything, obviously, but um, stay stay as, as committed as you can. And there's a lot of obstacles along the way for anything in life. And the thing I like to always say is if it were easy, everyone would be doing it. Hey, man, I thank you so much for sharing your experience, sharing how you've overcome all of these obstacles coming from your beginnings and being able to do everything. I mean, a lot of the people that are watching us, they probably share a number of the circumstances that you probably encountered throughout your life. People saying that they can't do this and or them themselves. I mean, that was my particular case. So thank you. May God bless your career path, everything else you're doing. I wish you continued success. Thank you so much. You know, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Watch the video you see on the screen right now so I can show you all the resources that I have collected that will guide you to be anything you want to be.